Gail Sophia, um, who is going to be talking with us, um, you know, having a workshop type presentation on a model of a framework of, of lesson planning, unit and lesson planning. Uh, I ask that you, um, it's not really, a, I don't even see it as a pilot because I've been using this particular um, unit and lesson plan for framework for the longest while. It's just that I haven't taught um, the third grade level course for the past three or four semesters. So that's the only reason why it was not in, in circulation more. But um, Dr. Sufia is going to spend some time with us um, doing um, that workshop on the, um, the backward design framework that I introduced um, to you. Conversation. I found out that we have some of the shared, under, uh, shared understanding and concern about some of the things that are happening in teacher education because of the professional standards board for New York State. Those are the things that we deal with: we deal with teacher um, education, teacher education policy, teaching standards, issues of that kind. And in my discussion with her recently, found out that she understood. Um, the backward design, and in fact, she runs workshops on behalf of the UFT. Is it UFT? Yes. Yes, on this particular framework. So I think that was last week. I asked her, I said, Listen, could you come please and speak to the students about this framework? Because, um, you know, I asked them to do it. The semester is going um, in case there are any difficulties. This would be a great opportunity for us to give them some help or to bring some closure, hopefully, to whatever the concerns and questions are. So um, she willingly agreed to come at this quick, in a quick time. So it didn't give us a lot of time, really, to do a lot of the usual technology stuff, um, except to videotape, try to videotape the lesson. We didn't get a chance to put a lot of the other pieces together. Um, that we will have more time to do for the spring, but for the, this fall semester, it's just really getting the information to you as quickly as possible because the semester is moving rather fast. I open the invitation to the other faculty and classes in the in the um, in, in the department, and I'm happy that um, Professor Alice Pat, who teaches 340, for those of you who have you took 340 with Dr. Professor Scott is teaching 314 and he's going to hopefully will be with us for quite a while. <laughs> we look forward to that. And she has brought her two um, colleagues to share with uh, this experience with us. So thanks again. Um, and I want to thank um, I, I want to thank Professor Stecker for making this possible. She willingly says, sure, come in and do what you need to do, do what needs to be done for the students. So you know, it was just wonderful the way she just opened the class and allowed us to come in to, to do this work. So I thank you very much. We have two other faculty members here, Dr. Kelleher, oh, three actually, Dr. Kelleher. Uh, most of you know Dr. Kelleher, right? Um, Dr. Jane Kelleher, Dr. Linda Barron. Linda Michelle Barron. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Uh, Linda Michelle Barron and Dr. Sheen Bag from um, Instructional Technology. If you have not met her yet, I hope you'll get to meet her soon. soon. <laughs> or you say, I'm out of here, right? <laughs> you say, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, you meet other more professors. And could you just introduce yourself, Ms. Um, Jones? Oh, uh, Jacqueline Jones. Jacqueline Jones. Sheila O'Neill. Sheila O'Neill. And Jacqueline okay. Jones is educational consultant and Sheila O'Neill is a professor at Adelphi University. Oh. They're just shy. Oh, okay. 
All right, so I'm going to turn things over to um, Dr. Sophia. And um, we have additional copies of the framework that I um, given to you, the lesson and you will plan framework. So I can leave, leave it here? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Gail Sukdeo, and I've been, I'll give you a little background. Um, I've been teaching for the last 15 years. I taught in a private parochial school in Brooklyn, grades K to 5, and now I'm at the middle school level, and I've been at the middle school for the last eight years. I am also a National Board Certified Teacher and um, I mentor teachers seeking National Board Certification, which is the highest credential in the United States of America. Um, also, um, sorry, I'm also a member of the New York Geographic Alliance Board of Directors, and I'm the state coordinator for the National Geographic Bee in New York State. All right. Um, what I'd like to distribute right now is just a copy of the agenda. Thank you. And uh, we can take one. And this is Dr. Clay's work, so I'd also like you to have a copy of this one also. So you're having a copy of uh, the first one, the first one I designed, the first one, and the second one is Dr. Clay's. And there's a reason why you need two, so I'll maybe explain that in a minute. And I know the session ends at 5.30, okay? So I promise not to keep you too long. Okay. All right, thank you. Is there anyone who does not have a copy of the agenda? Okay, these are extras. I want to make sure everyone has a copy. Okay. Is there anyone without a copy of Dr. Clay's copy or a copy of the seventh grade, yeah. Uh, just so that you know, I teach social studies at the seventh grade this year. I've been teaching eighth grade social studies for the last seven years in addition to mentoring teachers also at my school and also for the UFD. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone without one of these copies? Okay, great. All right. Uh, what I did, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, um, on mine, I integrated UBD and DI. And I'd like to begin by just asking, you know, what do you know about UBD? And as you give me your responses, I'll put it up on the board. And I'll, there's a reason why. So I'll put it here. UBD, Understanding by Design. And I'd like, you know, you to just tell me what you know about UBD. Anyone? Anything? Maybe you've heard something and you're not too sure about it. It's okay. You can share and I'll put it up here. And afterwards, we'll come back and we'll see, you know, if you were right on it. Okay. Anyone? Anything about UBD? It's backward design. Backward design. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Anything about UBD? Uh 
I'm sorry? You do a pre-assessment, so okay, pre-assessment. Anything else? All right. You wanted to share something? Have enduring understandings. I'm sorry? Have enduring understandings. Enduring understandings, okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, the reason why I did this is what I just did here was to pre-assess. I'm in front of my class and I would usually ask them something just to have an idea what it is, you know, maybe they have misconceptions about the topic I'm about to introduce. Maybe they do know a lot about it or maybe they don't have sufficient knowledge. So this right here is, it's data. It's data on my students, what they know, what they don't know. Maybe there's a misconception in, in their idea. Right so this data now would help me to determine how long I need to keep a class on this topic because it will tell me, in this case, either they know a lot or they don't know a lot. So this is my data. This is going to help me drive instruction. And this is what they're asking them, using data to drive instruction. This is an informal way of getting data on my students. From here now, I'll determine if I can keep them two weeks or maybe four weeks, or maybe tailor some of the plans I've already had in my mind for teaching this. All right. The one thing that we need to remember is UBD and DI, it goes together with differentiating instruction. So I'll just put DI here in the middle. All right. <coughs> Tell me now, do you know anything about <coughs> DI? But maybe you've heard a phrase or maybe you've heard a word about DI and you'd like to share that with me, anyone? I'm still gathering data on my students. DI. Students need, okay. Anything else? Is that how you differentiate instruction? Differentiate instruction, yeah, DI. Anyone? Learning styles. Learning styles, good. Anything else? Okay. All right. So we'll come back to this in a while, but for now, um, one of the things you have to know with UBD and DI is they support each other. According to Caroline Tomlinson, you cannot do one without the other, All right? So UBD, understanding by design, and UBD is what you are going to be teaching, and the DI part is how are you going to be teaching it, either through whole group instruction, small group instruction, through different modalities, the tactile, the kinesthetic, the auditory, the visual. So one is what and one is how. All right, and if you look on the handout that I give, what I have decided to well, what I decided to share with to share this afternoon is I'm teaching right now seventh grade social studies, so I brought I did um, an example of what I'm doing in the classroom. All right, and I brought some of the samples of my students' work, and I'll sh share that with you in a while. Uh, with UBD, you begin by brainstorming in your mind. You have a topic, Native American culture, seventh grade social studies. So you would have to more or less think, well, what do I want my students to know? What do I want them to understand? And what do I want them to be able to do? And what I do sometimes, I do it like this. And I brainstorm everything about Native American culture that may be on my mind. And as I'm doing this, I'm putting everything out on the side. Okay, make, okay, I'm putting different tribes and so on. So I'm just pretending in the interest of time, I have all these ideas here. All right, I have everything that I'm thinking about on Native American culture, out there on a graphic organizer. And when I'm done now, then I'll take them and I'll put three, I'll have sections. Students will know what I want them to understand and what I want them to be able to do. And I'll take from here, and I'll put it across here, another graphic organizer. 
because this is this is how this is how I do it and this is what helps me to get to where I want to go all right so I'm taking from here this is the first phase all right and I'm putting it here know understand and be able to do and if you watch at the back this is right here page four you see there the very set so I'm brainstorming and from the brainstorming I'm putting it there And what you have on the other side now, this is curriculum mapping. This is what this is going to show you the progression. It's also called a learning progression. In some countries, I think it's Australia, it's called task analysis. Okay? And what I do here now, again, you must begin with an assessment. If you watch at the bottom here, so this is how I'll implement this, and this actually is UBD here. But this is a global approach. This is learning style. You have two types of processing styles, an analytic approach and a global processing style. And this, the, the lesson plan that Dr. Clay has here, this is the analytic approach. So this is addressing your learning style. Because when I work with teachers, some can work this way and some can work this way. So the global processing style is this one here. So I am addressing your learning style because some a few, a few students or a few teachers can work in this way and, if, and then some can work like this. So I'm actually doing it here in front of you, addressing, um, differentiating instruction but through your processing styles. And I'd like you to take a look at this now, all right? First, I will do a pre-assessment or a baseline test. So I want to know from my students, well, uh, I have them at the seventh grade, so what do you know about Native American culture? So they will come in, they will tell me all these ideas. Oh, you know, um, they hunted the buffalo, or um, they lived in teepees, and they all feel like, you know, perhaps they live in, in teepees. So I will gather that information, and I'll use that information now. And say, well, okay, they know a lot already, or maybe I have some new students who are in the United States for the first time, so they didn't have this unit of study. So on the left side of this um, that I have here, you will see the assessment. You see formative assessment. So what I'll do first, I'll do the pre-assessment, and then now I'll decide, oh, okay, then I will do um, the vocabulary words. So that's what you call vocabulary front-loading. So I may decide, well, there are some words that they need to know before we actually go into the study. Um, they'll need perhaps a definition of geography. I'll need to cover the five themes of geography with them. So right in here, it may take me approximately two lessons. So that's why I put two lessons on the side. And when I'm done with, with the topics in this box here, then I'll want to assess my students. So that's why I have the formative assessment there. So I may ask, well, you know, provide me with examples of the five themes of geography in our neighborhood. This will tell me whether or not my students understood what I was trying to teach in this box here. And if they do not, because when I see what they're bringing, then I'll have to reteach. So right in here, I'll have to reteach this here if they don't get it right. Because this is the guy. This is the guy that I'm following now because I did this. Okay. Then you have another box here, nomadic society. These are the common understandings that I want my students to have. It may take me again approximately two lessons. And then, then I'll have a formative <coughs> assessment. Within this side, I'm sorry, on this side, I could decide to differentiate instruction right here again. Not every one of my students, let's say, and go up there, will be able to draw a map to illustrate the climate and major landforms of North and South America. All right, I may have another student, I may have to be able to assist in some, maybe they're just the basic outline. So within here, I may be able to do other things right on the side. When I get up to the top here, I have four major civilizations that were developed in South America and other major civilizations. It may take me a longer while here because we'll have to explore political, economic, and social. And on the side, the way I'm going to assess this, I'm going to use a T-chart. Maybe I may want to use something else again. So this allows you to put on the side what you know, you're trying to do with the students and how you will be assessing. If you look at the top, just before the top, that you have targeted curricular aim. That is. Uh, more or less the basic idea what you're trying to accomplish here. And what, what I really wanted to do was, in my lesson too, is the geographic factors influence the development of the different Native American cultures. I want my students 
to walk away with the idea that yes, you do had yes, you you had different Native American cultures, but what was the main reason? Why? Why you had different cultures in the northeastern part of the United States and in another part? And it was geography. So that's the main thing, and that's why if you look on this side here, on page two, you'll see the concept diversity of Native American cultures. That's the big concept. Diversity, there was diversity. And the big idea, you must have a big idea when you're doing UBD, I have the big idea here. Again, geographic factors determine the variety of different Native American cultures. Well, back to page five. At the very top is the ELO, Essential Learning Objective. And this is what students will be able to describe. At the very end of it all, after they've gone through all of this, this is what now. I started with the end in mind when I started with the big idea and I started with the concept of diversity of Native American culture. That was the, the big idea. And I was able to plan backward. That's why it's called understanding by this. And I planned this backward. But to plan it backward, I had to brainstorm, then I had to put it on the, what they will be able to know, understand, and be able to do. And now at the top now, this is what I want them to do after we've worked through this. I want my students to describe the geographic factors that influence the different Native American cultures. And this is also a scaffolding. It's a scaffolding all the way up to the top. But now, within here, not all my students will be able to write, let's say, a four-paragraph a, a four essay or a five-paragraph essay. I have English language learners in my midst, too. So that's why now, within here now, I'm differentiating instruction, but by I'm differentiating inst uh, instruction by product. So I'm asking the student, and I brought some samples for you to see. Some of them would be able to do an essay. Some may write a diary entry as someone you know, who lived during that time and interacted with the environment. Some may have, um, a lot of them like the song and the rap. So within the song or the rap, they would be able to show how environment influence a different Native American culture. Any questions so far? Um, with social studies, this is something that I struggle with. Um, how, how do you figure out what you want your students to know and what you want them to understand? Like, Through the standards, the uh, New York State social studies standards, yeah. So to know, I know it's the standard, but how do you no, you, you look within the standard and um, the performance indicators also, and you're looking at ex exactly what students are supposed to be covering in New York State. Yeah. Right. And then now, when, the, when you look at other material around you, then you say, okay, what do I really want them to know? And that can then interacting with colleagues in the department. And so, you, so I do have the opportunity to get other ideas also. But to know, like, here's is how to interpret a map. Mm -hmm. How do I make sure, because I have, like, a tendency to knowing on how to interpret a map, and then I don't, I don't repeat it again, interpreting a map of North and South America. You mean? I don't repeat the know and the understand. I know the interpret. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, that's between the book. Okay, when you put it out like this, it's scary. Now you have this <coughs> reflection back and forth. And this is also important. Reflection is very important because uh, I'll come back to the question there, right? But when you, when you have the formative assessment, that's where you have a lot of reflection because you're asking yourself, I wonder if my students got it. And by looking at what you're giving them, you know, how can I reteach this the next time that I do this lesson? Because I, I realize not everyone was able to follow in this section. So I have to stand back and say, well, maybe next time I'll try a different strategy or a different approach. All right, that's a reflection. And now back to the question that you were asking um, with the maps. How do you understand and um, know exactly what to put under know, what to put under understand, and what to put under to do? And one of the, the, um, the critiques, you know, they talk about a lot of the times we say what we want students to do. Our behavioral objectives are uh, written like I, students will be able to do. We always want students to do and to do. But I've seen a lot of times in classrooms when teachers write the behavioral objective, they will put students will be able to under, um, understand. And um, the comment is you cannot measure that understanding. You can't get inside and measure. 
but this is where you have the mix up. So this is, you want them to be able to do something, but you have the understanding at the back when you plan this. This is at the end of the lesson or end of you know, a couple sessions, they walk away with this understanding. And this can get confusing at times like what you're addressing. So sometimes what happens, you know, you can talk with a colleague and then somebody who has a little more experience, you know, in the department often will be able to assist. And then sometimes what happens is when you, the more you look at it, you're like, no, I want them to know this, right? I want them to know that you had different geographic areas so that when they get a map, they can say, okay, this is a map of the United States. This section here is the, the northeastern section. This here is the southern area that kn knowing of it. Yeah. So can this I, is... Can I say something here? The understanding, even as it is laid out here, is a content knowledge okay. that when you do, when you read your text, or when you read the, um, when you read your text, or when you read an article, the understanding are those kind of key ideas that you want the student to come away from the lesson with. When I'm teaching my classes, I want to. The textbook has how many, what, 20 pages per chapter? But I want my students to come away with five key points about an area of development, cognitive development. And that's where the understanding, the content knowledge that comes from my research, that comes from my understanding, understanding the things that you're saying, mm -hmm. speaking with your colleague, but that will come from my own research that might be over and above the textbook. It will come from my discussion with colleagues. It mm -hmm. will come from my what I got from attending conferences. And they, but or, what more so the standards. Mm -hmm. If you understand New York State standards around whatever subject here, that tells me what <coughs> the understandings I should have students develop as content knowledge. And is that? Yes, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Now, um, I want to also point out that in doing something like this, it is, is itself differentiating instruction. This is what you call high prep. High prep differentiating instruction, a curriculum compacting. This is an example of something called, oh, let me just erase the word here. Curriculum compacting, and this is one aspect of differentiating instruction. Because you're taking, the, you're taking the, the content area and you're determining what you want them to know and you're compacting it down into this map. So this is because you're not teaching everything there is to teach on Native Americans. You can't teach all of them because it will take you months and you have other topics, so you determine that. Um, as I said before, this is high prep, because you have high prep and low prep, differentiating of um, instruction. Uh, the assessment, you see the assessment component, that is also an aspect of differentiating instruction. So I'm going to, as I reflect on this, I'm doing reflection or analysis um, of what I just did there. And I mentioned brainstorming. That's also the language of differentiating instruction. I use graphic organizers. That's also the language of differentiating instruction. So when you do it, you know the language. Language of DI. Um, assessment, right? Assessment is built into the curriculum um, mapping. Anything else again? The assessment is formative and at the top is a summative. So you have two types of assessment. In this um, mapping, you have the formative, and the formative is what? Does anyone know the formative? And then you have the summative. At the very top, I'm asking for a product from my student, I'm summing up the unit on Native Americans. But the formative, this is what I'm doing here, ongoing, ongoing. So I've included formative assessment in this curriculum mapping. I've included summative. Um, I did scaffolding there too, if you watch. I'm taking the student through a whole progression. And this is, as I said before, this is a, a learning progression.
Any other questions so far? Can I'm you all. Put that word learning progression. Learning progression. Okay. Yes. Learning progression. And if you, um, the, this comes from Papa. He talks about learning progression. So that's, to me, this is a, a third component when I'm doing this, in that I have UBD as one component. I have DI in this, and I have a learning progression, an LP. And as I said before, in Australia, it's called a task analysis. The same learning progression is called a task analysis. And in another um, uh, resource, it's called a, some, I can't remember the first word, but it's something map. So you could very, you could very well see it somewhere else as a something map. You could see it as a task analysis. Um, also, within this, if you, can, if you look at it, you'll see Bloom's taxonomy is also embedded in this, Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's, tax, Bloom's taxonomy is also part of the language of differentiating instruction. So I'll put it right here. And I'm addressing, if you um, look here, I'm Are they familiar? Are the students familiar with Bloom's? Bloom's Are, you, Are you familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? I better be. And uh, <laughs> in here also is modality. I'm addressing modalities, different modalities. And if you look up here, you would see. Um, Cartoon, that's for the visual learners, all right? Um, also, the song or the rap, the poem, the diary entry, the acrostic. So the students who, um, sorry, yes? No, I was just wondering, are you connecting that with guidance multiple intelligence? Yes, and also learning, so yes. Because Right. Can I ask you something with the KDD? Yes. When you mentioned Bloom's taxonomy, you're going to say no. Are you talking about knowing the sense of Bloom's taxonomy or in terms of, I was thinking information processing in terms of the, the, the concept, the terms? Mm -hmm. Is that what you, and then understanding? Right, so yes, you, you can also include Bloom's taxonomy here too. So that would be the basic. This will be the basic, like identify. And then understanding would be the comprehension of it? Yes, the comprehension of it. Do the application and then yes. you move up. Yes, right, you move up. So this, right, so everything, you know, it's like, when you look at it, it's everything that, you know, we've been, you know, we have been teaching students. We want them to understand Bloom's taxonomy. We want them to understand UBD, DI, learning styles, all these words. We want them to scaffold the students learning. We want to address, uh, right, curriculum compacting. So, so within this, you're touching on all, even the questions. That's why I like this because you know everything is is in there, all right? Okay. And um, are there any questions? Any other questions? No other question. Okay, I'm going to pass around some of my students. Um, Wait, yes. We go, um, I, I, I would imagine that they sort of have the time for students to be asking questions, but. There are our students here with different who are teaching, who are specializing in different subject areas. Mm -hmm. We have students who are math instructors, who are um, PE. Um, do we have anyone from the science and, as I said, child of ed? Um, could the one, um, the students who are in the various subject areas, will you please speak up and ask the question of relevance? To, to your planning, um, what difficulties have you been having, if any, um, in applying this model to your planning? Could you just um, say something about that, please? I'm trying to figure out how I would apply this um, differentiated instruction for a writing lesson. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, I'm, just by looking at the essential learning objective, I'm trying to figure out how can my product be different if they're all 
working towards the writing. That's something I struggle with. How can I make a fine, a summative assessment mm -hmm. and have it di differentiated? Like right now, I'm working on a realistic fiction piece with them. Mm -hmm. How can I do that with them in a differentiated way? Do you want the student to uh, more or less tell you, let's say, the elements of that type of fiction? Or you want them to write an actual piece? Today we did the elements. Mm -hmm. We've been doing the elements. They wrote the piece. And mm -hmm. today they switched to the partner mm -hmm. to look for the elements okay. of that fiction. And uh, the final product is that it should be um, the, language, the English language should be proper as far as grammar and that it should have only the elements of realistic fiction. Okay. What I do with my students, I would give them an opportunity. Some students, I say, you know what, you can do a dialogue because for the student who is now, you know, learning the language, maybe what this student can do at this point is just one sentence versus another student who is very, you know, fluent and can write a paragraph or two paragraphs. So I would give an opportunity and say, you know what, you can write a dialogue, that's fine. You can write an essay, right, four or five paragraphs. Um, so for my student who's now learning, he or she feels comfortable because I'm going to accept this because I'm now in a dialogue between two characters. So you would have to get one character's name and another character's name, and in that I can determine if the student has the ability, you know, you know, or understood exactly what I was teaching. This dialogue here cannot do this, and I don't want to frustrate the student. But this one might be able to do four paragraphs. This yeah, one can. So this what I would I would do something like that. Or sometimes you know you, you could ask for this too. And with this, sometimes they would just need like maybe four or five words. Another four or five words. So they're making up one here and here's an extra. So you're differentiating instruction by product here by giving them an opportunity and giving them choices. These are your choices. Mm -hmm. Is that student directed? Whereas, uh, you know, the curriculum is teacher directed. Teacher. But the curriculum compacting where the student uh, takes, uh, sort of surpasses the regular curriculum mm -hmm. and uh, goes above. So, where they take the responsibility, which the teacher would give them just a little edge on it, but with the students really taking that responsibility and compacting the norm normal curriculum, what they're supposed to get, let's say, in fourth grade, and then going beyond that. Is that what curriculum contacting is? This, this is the planning. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's say um, you are the teacher making that conscious decision. You know, I want my students to be able, so you have all the information out there, but you're not going to be teaching every single thing. The, the basic idea, like in this case, um, the environment determined it. So to me, that was the main idea. So. I put everything else to the side, but whilst I'm doing this, I'm pulling in other things like they need to know the math, they need to know math skills. So this there is for the teacher to actually do. But afterwards, the teacher could have extra activities on the side. Let's say if you are more advanced in my class versus another student, I may have now activities like the enrichment or a little fold on the side, and you can take material from there, and you're working on that whilst others are coming along. Yes, because Dr. Ranzuli has a piece in his uh, whole program with curriculum compacting. Uh, I guess it's another name for differentiation where the other end of the special ed spectrum, we sort of forget those gifted kids that are in regular classes. Right. Yeah. So what this does, it sort of puts them in control of, of where they're going. Mm -hmm. And then, um, when uh, they are talking about differentiating instruction, they consider, they say that the teacher could either do low prep, differentiating instruction, and low prep. Um, I have my students say. What is low prep? Low preparation. So that's less preparation. No, it's, um, let me just rephrase this, I'll show you. Low prep. They say, okay, they speak with the, about the language first. You must know the language of the eye. And then they say, you have low prep activities that you can do right away there. It doesn't take a lot of preparation. That's what they mean, low prep. All right? 
VI and high prep. And an example of low preparation, I would, let's say, have a regular assignment and I'll say, you know what? How many of you want to work alone? And they're already sitting in groups, four people in a group. How many of you would like to work with a partner? Or how many of you want to work with the entire group? So right there, so if a student would like to work alone, you would just pull away your chair on the table away from the other, so I know that you're working alone. So I'm addressing their sociological preferences. So I'm differentiating instruction by student sociological preferences, and that's low prep, because right there, there I'm just giving you that chance to work how you want to work. I may, um, another example of low prep, let's say we have the uh, social studies exit project. I'm giving you a choice. So our next way again for choice is um, for differentiated instruction is through choice. I'm giving you the choice. You tell me, okay, what topic do you want to address for your exit project? And one may say, well, I would like to do the Great Depression. So then you would be doing Great Depression, and another student might be doing, let's say, um, the Civil Rights Movement. So again, by choice there too, or by, by interest or by topic. So that's the next way. So not much preparation goes into here because you're addressing what the student likes. And that will make them want to do the work because I have an opportunity to choose what I want to do. And with a high prep curriculum compacted. So when you actually sit down and you plan and you map out this curriculum uh, map like that, this is an example of high prep. High, a lot of preparation is involved in this. Um, asking a student open-ended questions. That's an example of low prep DI. So when I ask a question in class and I say, well, you know, how would history have been different if um, Hitler was caught and tried for his crimes against humanity? That's open-ended. And they call this as an example of low prep. Yes? I often encourage new teachers when they're beginning to di differentiate to start with low prep activities because they're less time consuming. Yes. So you start with your low prep first mm -hmm. and then slowly, slowly. as an educator yes. move up to your more high, uh, yeah. high prep yes. activities. And even in the classroom, let's say when the students walk in and you know you're given like 45 minutes to teach a class. Mm -hmm. um, whole group teaching. I engage the whole group by, uh, by brainstorming in the very beginning. So whole group teaching and then afterwards I may explain certain things and I say, you know what, in your groups I'd like you to do this, this and that. So I switch now and small group instruction. So those two activities, those two instructional approaches are also low prep DI. First I did whole group and now afterwards now into small group. So that is also considered low prep. And you're doing it right there. As I tell many of the teachers, most of these things you are already doing it. And you let the names you know, confuse you or frighten you. And when I break it down like this and I say a simple thing like brainstorming with students, that is an example right there. You're gathering data and you're using that data to drive instruction. But it's just an informal way of getting data. And that's a buzzword. We need to use data to drive instruction. I just did it right there. And in like five minutes, I could say, oh, they have a lot of you know, misconceptions about this, so then I'll focus in this area. And that's assessment again. The word is called assessment. And I'm, I'm pre-assessing, and they call it a baseline test. And it's, it's still part of you know, the whole DI spectrum. And, and um, the, um, I'm sorry, with the lesson plan format, where it says essential questions, mm -hmm. when you talk about higher order open-ended questions, is that what we're talking about when we talk about essential questions, or is that just part of what essential questions yeah. might be in, in, um, in the structure of faculty design? Yeah. She's talking about the one that I gave to the group. The essential questions as a, a part of the backward design. Yes, back, yeah, part, part of the backward design. Do you want to talk about the questions? What is what's meant by essential questions in backward design? Essential questions, or are you talking about the, the ELO also, the essential learning objective? Because that's where you want to go at the very top, the main objective. What no, I'm talking about the, the format that. Did you, you have. I'm speaking of that format that I gave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in backward design, they talk about the essential questions. Yes. Essential questions are essential questions that are essential questions. Okay, this is, all, this is also this year too. 
Yeah. This is the, what I want them to know, what I want them to understand, I want them to be able to. So this ties into that. But it's framing it in a question for what is it that I want, what are the questions I'm going to ask students mm -hmm. to get to those ways. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. What are the questions I'm going to ask students to get to what, the, what I want them to know, right. what I want them to understand, what I want them to do. Is, um, it, when I was doing teacher training, we always had to come up, they didn't call it essential questions then, but we always had to show our, super, our college supervisors what questions we intended to ask right. during a lesson. Mm -hmm. um, that's essentially what it is, preparing yourself, thinking through. Right. Now we know more about questioning. Now we know that there are different levels of questioning. Mm -hmm. And certainly using the KUD should give us a sense of the kinds of questions that the various levels of questions that we can ask. Right. Yeah. And you can ask it too along the line of Bloom's taxonomy too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where it comes in. And also, if you're asking these questions, you know to yourself, I'm going to be designing an activity to allow the student to engage in that activity, to bring it out of them and to have them actually do the work. So whilst you have the essential questions running in your mind, you're also thinking of an instructional activity to have them do it so that it more or less answers the question that you have and it moves them in a particular way. And then, um, what you need to be also concerned with is many times we have this problem, instructional strategies. This causes a lot of confusion. So it's important for you to distinguish it right now, instructional strategies and instructional resources. Because the, sometimes it's asking you for a strategy and you'll put something else here, instructional resources. This comes up a lot of the times when I work with national board candidates. They ask you on the national board, you know, what, what instructional strategies did you use? And as you finish with that question, what instructional resources did you use? Could someone give me an example of an instructional strategy? Huh? Discovery learning? But I'm actually a strategy, let's say a class is coming to you, right? And you're working with them within, let's say, 45 minutes. You're using a strategy. What strategy are you using right there in that room to teach, what, to teach a lesson? Oh, I'm sorry, um, the gentleman behind you. I'm, I'm coming. Oh, okay, go ahead. Questioning. Questioning, very good. An instructional strategy. I'll ask a question. I'll start a question, or oh, maybe I'll, I'll have a question, right? Questioning. How about having a discussion, right? Yes? We can bring in the way you ask questions, like prior knowledge. Right, so then you have, it begins with B. I did it there. Brainstorming. That's an instructional strategy because I'm brainstorming with the students to actually understand what they, they know about the topic already before I move on there. Yeah. Brainstorming, right? Whole group teaching, small group teaching, strategy, right? Scaffolding, demonstration, right? The strat modeling. I may model it first, and then after I give, I model it two times, and then I said, okay, it's your turn. So that's a strategy. So if my supervisor would, you know, come in and say, what strategies are you using? I said, okay, I, you know, I brainstormed the first, and then I did whole group teaching, and then I'm now, as you walk in, they are actually in their groups, and that's small group in, um, teaching there. All right, and what about the resources? Anyone? Resources. It could be technology. What else? A ruler, a map, resource textbook, right? Workbooks, all right? Uh, if I have any manipulatives in the room, so these are the resources. You're using a map, right? I may be using an overhead projector, all right? Overhead projector, um, textbook. And this is what confuses a lot of the teachers right here. Because when you start to write, 
and you have to do for reflection, you have to talk about the strategy. And sometimes, and even a graphic organizer, if I put a graphic, I bring in one of those laminated graphic organizers and I put it up here, that's an instructional resource. It's not a strategy. Yes? So then would the essential question then fall under the instructional strategy part? Essential, but that, the essential question is more or less framing. You know, you have the, the framing right. in your mind, right. But when you start, if you look at, uh, there's a map, you look at it, the, here, you'll start to see a lot of the strategies right in here too. You'll start to see the strategies here. Right. Let's say vocabulary, um, teaching of vocabulary. You may want to teach vocabulary and um, have the kids make little um, vocabulary brochures. All right, so when they open it up like, oh, yeah. You can see, and they have the focus. This is what I do with my kids when I w want them to understand certain vocabulary. I fold the paper like this, and I say, see, like, I have 10 vocabulary words. Select any one that you want. And let's say they select like, the word tycoon. So on the outside here, they'll write tycoon, right? When you get inside here, I say, write the word tycoon here, and write the definition of tycoon as the textbook or the dictionary would have it. On this side, write a sentence using the word tycoon and then illustrate that sentence right now in the middle here for me. I'm addressing modality, I'm addressing the visual, the tactile, and then I have them to get up, go find someone in the room and exchange your word with that person's word. I mean, addressing the kinesthetic aspect of it, giving them a chance to move. They like that. And then now read what that, what that person has. So in that way now, if I tell them to do all 10 words, you know, they will be upset. But if I approach it this way, then they are not afraid they can get up and exchange with you because your word was different from my word. Then eventually, I can perhaps ask for five and they'll be willing to do it because they're a little more confident with it. So um, this in itself now is, an in, is a, a resource. I'll bring in one from my eighth grade class and I'll model. That's the strategy there. But I'm bringing a resource. So back and forth here. All right. Um, any other questions? So I'll, the, For the math students, yes. how relevant is this? Are you seeing any relevance yeah. to your planning and what you've been doing? Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? One second, I'm sorry. Yes? No, I, was, I was thinking the assessment, even the assessment I've seen. I mean, there's different ways of using the format than for ELA class or social studies class, but it still works if you're doing for the closure, for example, you can use the essential questions to make sure that they understood those questions mm -hmm. that you're asking at the beginning. Yes. You can test them again at the end as a closure. Yes. So that would work also as a post assessment. So, so, so is this helpful to you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I thought that uh, you know your social studies lesson and the Native Americans fits so well for your your uh, planning and, and shows us so clearly you know the process you go through. But I wonder if you have worked with math teachers and if you can tell us a little bit about their experience that you have. With the math teachers, I've worked with them on national board, national board certification. Well, I mean in backwards design. Let's say you have a fraction unit. The fraction unit. Or well. In with fractions you want, right? So then we'd have to brainstorm. Yeah, right. What do you want them to know again and understand and be able to do? And then put out all those ideas on math under the fraction and then sit with other colleagues. And this is good for like a department. So you have the input from the different colleagues. And maybe one person will say, well, you know, um, no, 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 you, we, we need to think of <coughs> other aspects of this and then put it together. So it comes, comes in very useful for a, a small group department. Right. I have talked to some people who use back in design, and actually this experience that they have described is that in their schools where it is being used, that there's a lot of professional development time. And they don't do this in isolation. They do this with groups of teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit different than just you know, sitting down to do your lesson plan. So I'm saying now in your school, has mm -hmm. your school adopted this practice plan or is this something that you use? No, this is something that we did in the social studies department from last okay, year. Social studies, social studies, studies right. Your math, you My math um, they, they have a math supervisor. Mm -hmm. 
So she does something different. But in the social studies and the science, this is what we were doing last year, and we are continuing this year now because when you bring something like this, you can't just the entire school because a lot of people, you know, would be up. So we use it in the social studies, then this year they're using it again, and gradually we are bringing in the other departments. So this has been taking, this has been quite an initiative where you have a lot of uh, conversations going on, professional development. You're yes. starting within a certain department. Yes. And you're getting comfortable with it, and your social studies work again, it lends itself very nicely to it. Right. And then if you get involved, they're going to be working together and developing. And we also have in our cluster, we have, um, in addition to social studies department, we have a cluster. So I teach with uh, a math teacher, so she has the same students that I have. So like on this one here where you have interpreting math skills, it allows us now to put a math activity in here. It, it lends itself to interdisciplinary planning to an, an interdisciplinary activity. Yeah. That just made me think of something. Often we get into a school system and we think, the whole school has to be doing whatever the practice is that we think is best practice. But one of the things we want to infuse and embed in our teachers, our prospective teachers, is that they can create their own cohorts. They don't have to wait till the whole school buys it. Right. They can, the, the purpose that I, as I understand, and I'm really learning a great deal about how back to their schools, where they find colleagues with like minds, that they could brainstorm some of these concepts and practices, it would be a wonderful thing. In every, I would think in any content area, Yes. as long as um, you're open to it, to following some of the conceptual frameworks that we see here. To see them. And that's what you call action research. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. But that, you know, in the ideal world, curriculum, all of curriculum, should be a community project. Yes. All of curriculum, so much has been written about the fact that curriculum, all, everything we do in school is social. And the planning of curriculum is certainly a central social event. That's in the ideal world. In the real world, most of us as teachers sit alone and we plan in schools that are very well organized with, and with a philosophy and a consciousness about curriculum as community. Um, you know, th they make provisions for teachers to plan together, but the real world is that you sit alone in some isolated place, sometimes as college professors, but days on end, planning a lesson, planning a unit to cover 15 weeks. I mean, that's the reality of what we do. So knowing what is possible is, you know, and, and, and knowing what is possible can be done at a collective level, but also as individuals, as so we do, teachers live in isolated lives, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the first, well, that's one of the frustrating things about being a teacher in many settings, that you have to work alone. But, and you, but you draw on the same knowledge nevertheless, even as you mm -hmm. work in isolation. And we hope for the ideal world, and we can try to make it, but. <laughs> I, I just, I, I, I'll tell you, math was, it was funny, because math was an area of concern for me when I started teaching. I was teaching second grade, it was a problem, then it became fifth grade. And I would collaborate with every morning I'd come in, a half an hour early to meet with the math cluster. That was what you can do as an individual. And I think, you know, we don't have to accept the fact that you, you know, must work alone. You find people, you you trust that you find some kind of common link with, that you support each other, and it really does make a difference. And I and I, I'm not just talking about um, this design, but in everything we do, it helps you to um, move further. I, I think Alice got the reason she brought two of her colleagues is because they believe that this isn't a systematic thing necessarily that the school does, but you know, when you think in a way that says we must embrace each other and help each other to learn to have a learning and rich school. And this is important because the buzzword is action research. And what I've um, experienced in my school is um, I have the opportunity to work with a literacy teacher and uh, we are doing geography right now and they 
attended a workshop with me at, with, uh, um, was in Jackson Heights over the mm -hmm. summer. It was a five-day workshop and um, was given by the New York Geographic Alliance. And these are literacy teachers and they were following, and one was a science. Mm -hmm. And in our building, they keep coming to me and we, you know, talking about geography and their planning and the textbooks that they are, and the, the, the books that they are using, they are talking about how can I connect this with geography. Mm -hmm. You see, because I took them, and in addition, I mentored them as national board candidates. So they are seeing the value of, you know, not just teaching literacy by itself, but bringing in the geography. Because when they talk about the diary of Anne Frank, the students have no idea, you know, where is Europe? And I have the materials in Europe. So I'm sharing that with them, and they're excited about it, too. And as I keep telling them, I say, write it up. It's an action research. You'll be able to reflect on this and see how you've impacted student learning, and perhaps the ways you have measured student outcome. So that's what they're doing right now. But that's just some. And eventually, the other literacy teachers are like, what's going on in your room? What are you doing? I'm coming and I'm seeing students are excited. So one is talking to the other, and that's what's happening. Any other question? OK. I'm just going to share some of my students' work, work, work here with you. And um, they were working on this up to last week and this week, too. So we could pass some on this side here. You could look at it. Back with the ELO at the top, I gave them choices, and you'll see what they did. So we can pass, pass around, take a quick look. It's based on the same learning progression. And I just want to stress, I just want to stress with respect to Dr. Clay's unit planning template. And this one, one is addressing an analytic processing style, and one is addressing a global process. It's the same thing. But some people prefer to work like this, and some want to do it this way. No, this, you know, no, the same rubric, but I'm asking for like, make sure you include at least five facts if you're writing a poem about Native America. And if you're doing an essay, make sure you have at least five facts. So I'm looking across in terms of content there. You have the five facts. Or if you're doing a drawing, make sure you have five of you know, those things that I can see and check it off. You show me five ways that they, the, the, the environment impacted. No, if they use the, um, let's say the bones, the stone or whatever it is in the environment to make jewelry, that's one way that they interact with the environment. Okay, maybe now they use... Um, Okay, I would, um, be, before I said, you know, the students with the assignment and they've decided, I said, okay, make sure whatever one that you're choosing, 
if we are looking for at least three things. Make sure you have three facts in there that will show someone how the environment impacted Native American culture. So I'm looking to make sure that you have the three. If you do have the three, um, now I'm looking to see, besides that now, in terms of like grammar, spelling, and punctuation. So one part of the rubric would have for the content. And in the content, I'm looking for maybe three, or if I decide it's four, four things in that definitely shows strong that this impacted. Then I'm perhaps looking at, let's say, you know, the grammar, spelling, and punctuation there. Um, if I'm asking for an illustration, I want to see maybe at least two illustrations showing me that the environment impacted culture. So this is what I'll set up before, and therefore I'm looking for this now. So if you write a song for me or a poem, I'm looking to see at least you have three facts or three main ideas there. I'm looking at the bottom. I want a nice illustration. Could you also evaluate them through an exit card? Uh, yes, you can use an exit card as a pre-assessment um, on the side. You see, as you're looking at the, uh, the curriculum. Yeah, I've noticed that, but um, I've seen it done in class as, as, a, as a sort of um, closure to the lesson. Yes. To see if they, especially in math, it works because right. you're checking to see whether they understood whatever you were working on that day. And if they have additional questions. Yeah. So as they're leaving the room or before they leave, right. they, they leave that there for you. So you could put that. I'll show you, we can put up here also on the um, level learning progression map. Right here on the side here, it could be one of your, um, right there. Or you can give them a choice, so either you have um, a question to ask me still, or something that, but yeah. right there. To write, on, right. write it on the, on the card. The little cards, yes. And then you can grade it or, you know, right. to see that it's good. That's a great right. tool for uh, Yes. But put it on the side here for them to because, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Um, the end product, let's talk about the end product of whatever the lesson is or the unit or whatever. You say that the students have choices. How do you handle students that consistently would take the easy choice? They're going to do the drawing. They're going to do whatever is easiest and say, here's my product. Well, well. How do you get them mm -hmm. to go deeper into the content and actually come up with a product that shows some understanding rather than surface understanding? Okay. I would ask, you know, before you actually get into it, bring it, and I want to see what you will be doing. And if I see that, you know, you have something else, I know what you'll do. I know what you'll do. You'll do something easy. I want you to go beyond. I want you to include two more or three more. So in that way, I'm encouraging them because you're right. If you just give them a choice like that, what do you do? Someone will do the easiest one here too. So um, so before you actually would bring me your um, project or bring me the assignment that you plan on doing, I want to see it for myself. And I, from working with them, I know they're capable or they're not capable. Of, so I actually encourage them. Say no, this is this will not be sufficient. But give me maybe two more, you know, of something. Or this one will be easy. Will be better for you because. If the, you bring me something and I look at it and say, you didn't touch on this area enough, so add some more details. Yeah? And then I'm also looking at it whilst they're working on it, too. Because there's a, there's a world of difference between doing an illustration or a rap and actually going through to that, becoming a character in that particular time frame mm -hmm. and then writing a diary as if you lived within that time frame impacting on whatever your objective is or your greater understanding. So there's a big, mm -hmm. vast difference between those two kinds of products. And do you at any time move the students from the continuum of the, you know, the easiest to going through the end of Bloom's taxonomy so they get to the synthesis? Yes. And then uh, what I'll do, I'll actually be watching to, and I know you know, who's playing around, who wants an easy way out because I'm in the classroom with them at the time. And then I said, okay, the last assignment, you did a rap or you did a song. Would you try another one? I would always encourage you to try something else. Because if you don't do that, they'll stay right there and they will not move. And you have to let them know that, listen, I want you to try something else. Too. So would you ever just say, would you ever like, would you see that number of students are going for that? Just remove that from as an option. 
Yes, sometimes, yeah. If you realize that everyone is choosing this all the time, next time, or say, you know what, I'd like to replace this with, uh, let's try something else. Yes, you can't always give them, if, if you see they're doing one thing over and over, you can't. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You know what you can do, too, sometimes I've created a tic-tac-toe so. board, and on the tic-tac-toe board, even though they may have that artistic um, inclination, there are different types of activities on this tic-tac-toe board that do encourage the higher levels. So if they've already selected an illustration for this project, the next time they have to select something else from the board. Okay, and everyone has to do that. Okay. And even in mathematics, I heard you um, talking about math. Um, you can say with geometric figures, you can give one group your, your lower group and a simpler geometric task, okay? And then another group, the same type of task, but a little more advanced, and they don't even realize that they're they're easier. Right, and you have to differentiate. Exactly, you differentiated right. your instruction. You can start with your question. Yeah, actually, I've done that in uh, when teaching with um, with the students, like you can give various uh, equations. Yes. Some yes. some that are better. They better handle that stuff, so I give them a harder one, perhaps. Some that will, you know, give them a simple one. Not too easy either, you know. You don't want to. Um, just to shed, yeah, this is what this is what she's talking about. You can have different activities here, and you you can tell the student you select an activity and a diagonal, so they'll select this one, this one, or this one, or they can go across, or they can come down, and you can set it up in a way. So even though let's say they're taking one that you know, but you're not going to be happy with. Eventually, they're going to have to choose one that challenges. So this is what she's talking about: the tic tac toe method. You have the assignments there, and you can mix, you know an easy one there, but they have to go this way. And this is also part of differentiating instruction. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know about you, but I find it just quite useful and quite, you know, quite enjoyable. Um, <laughs> um, but it's, I think it's 5 thirds of the time. This yeah. is usually the end of the work yeah. of time. Yes. yes. So we're going to have to um, close at this time. And thank Dr. Sophia for, like I said, just willingly say yes, I'll come at short notice. So I thank, thank you.